The Rock and Roll and Coffee Show is brought to you by Writers and Rockers Coffee Company, keeping the music and memories alive with some damn good coffee. Be sure to pick up your Rock and Roll and Coffee Show coffee only at writersandrockerscoffee.com. And also brought to you by Retroactive, located at Broadway at the Beach in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, keeping you retro with everything from 70s, 80s, and 90s. Shopretroactive.com. It's the Rock and Roll and Coffee Show. Yeah, we do. Hello, I am Joe Sevilla, and this is the Rock and Roll and Coffee Show. My next guest is model Lori Tucker. Now, Lori has modeled all over the world. She has appeared in countless ads and commercials. And Lori has also starred in music videos alongside David Gilmore and Rick James. She was also in LA Gun's sex action video, and probably her most notable video was Van Halen's Hot for Teacher video. Now, I'm going to talk with Lori about all of this and more. Now, it is also time for another Rock and Roll and Coffee Show giveaway. So one lucky winner will win an Eddie Van Halen Funko Pop figure signed by Lori, courtesy of Retroactive in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Now all you need to do to enter is send an email to rnrcoffeeshow at gmail.com with the subject line hot for teacher and you will be entered to win the signed Van Halen Funko signed by Lori Tucker. Entries must be received by March 1st and one winner will be chosen randomly. Good luck, good luck, and a good look. And I hope you enjoy this conversation with Lori Tucker. Let, let's go back to the beginning, not the very beginning when you were born, of course, but let's go back to the beginning. Thank when, you. Um, when you were a kid, now growing up, did you grow up in California? Yeah, I actually grew up um, in the San Fernando Valley, the infamous valley. Um, one of nine kids. I have six nine. brothers and yeah, wow. <laughs> six brothers and two sisters. So my parents were really busy. Mm. Um, yeah, so uh, we had so many of us. I'd kind of, we'd kind of we'd move into a house, destroy it, move into another house, kind of destroy them. <laughs> so I lived all I over the valley, you know. Yeah. yeah, Northridge, Sherman Oaks, Reseda, Sepulveda, you know, all over. Okay. So yeah. when did you decide that you wanted to be a model, or how did that all unfold? So, like, I don't know how that happens. How does that happen? I, yeah, I I actually really consider myself extremely lucky because you know. Um, I think every girl wants to model, you know, right. <laughs> whether we really should or not, um, or have what it takes or not. But uh, I was, there was a department store out here called Montgomery Wards. I don't know if mm -hmm. you guys had yeah. Monkey Wards. Mm -hmm. And they had this little uh, club called the Pace Setter Club. And there was a kind of a little class you could take, just kind of a community thing. And it was really inexpensive and we really couldn't afford it because we had no money. But it was like a little six week course. And they would have you after you kind of graduated this the store would have you do like tea room modeling in their little cafeteria do modeling in their departments like for clothing and things like that and through that i started i was i started that when i was like 13 and 14 and i started to meet photographers through through doing that and i would just do test shoots which you know photographers want to get pictures for their book and you need pictures for your book or portfolio and uh, yeah, I just started doing testings and, um, you know, like I said, we didn't have a lot of money. And I just remember going, somebody had told me to go down to the Pasadena art school and they would have a list of photographers that are willing to test. And, you know, having so many brothers, uh, we would have maybe three or four vehicles in our backyard in right. different levels of working, you know um and car parts so I would just grab like a Pinto or my dad's 1960 Dodge van that he was always working on and you know go into LA and and just meet these photographers and uh do do photos so I just started to build my book up and I think I was about 16 and a half and I got my first paid job and had gone into an agency when I was 17 um and got my first agent and then before I turned 18 uh an agent from Paris had come out and to my agency and asked if I would, you know, wanted to go to Paris. Oh, wow. And it, yeah. And it was January, but he wanted me to go before Christmas. And I said, no, I, I want to be home for Christmas. So I went January, it was absolutely freezing. And I went with a trunk full of all the complete wrong clothes, no jacket no. from LA. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just froze my butt off. 
And really from that point on, you know, I worked there and got an amazing jobs traveling and started to build my book. And so when I came home uh, in Europe, you don't really usually make a lot of money. It's really the place you go to build your book and get really amazing photos because their magazines are, are fantastic. And um, so then I came home and, and started to work here and pays better. <laughs> sure. Now, so, were your parents supportive through all this? Because I mean, their young daughter is going yeah. to meet all these guys that want to take pictures, <laughs> right? So, I mean. <laughs> it, it, exactly. I would not even let my daughters do that by right. themselves at all. But um, it's funny because I would always drag, you know, my brother Tommy with me, who was younger than me, or my little sister, who she couldn't have helped me if somebody tried to, right. you know, kidnap me. But I, I figured with the two of us, it would be more difficult, you know, to shove us in a van and, and hijack it. So, um everybody actually on that list um and then word of mouth people just turned out to be you know good people and uh, legitimate and i thank god luckily didn't have any problems you know just a couple little things here and there and i would just lie. i remember this photographer was you know um making some moves and i was only like 16 and a half and i said oh what time is it my mom and dad are waiting downstairs no. <laughs> you know good one. So they weren't but yeah. you know, and yeah, so sometimes they would drive it. So they, they were, I think they were very excited that I was going to Paris and doing all this. Um, my dad had been an actor early on in, okay. in his career. Um, and so he kind of, you know, taught me to be very professional, shake people's hands um, and always kind of guided me in, in that way. Uh, so yeah, luckily things worked out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I was going to ask if your parents were entertainers, if they were in the business and stuff. So your yeah. dad was an actor. Well, he, yeah, he was for a, a short time. He did some TV, you know, he, they came out here in the forties. So uh, when I think the Valley was a lot of, you know, orange orchards and avocados right. and things like right. that, but um, he did some stuff, but then, you know, started having a family and, and ended up doing other stuff. But you know, he knew enough to, to guide me a little bit, which was, which was really great, actually. Now, did they let you go to Paris by yourself? Did you go by yourself? Yeah. Um, the agent, um, you know, I was going through my agency here and the agent came there to the, so, you know, they're pretty much guarantee you that you're going to be taken care of and you'll, you know, they'll, they'll make sure you have money and food and everything until you start to work. And then they pay me back. But I'm sure my parents were were probably a little afraid. And, you know, we didn't have internet. We didn't have cell phones, anything like that. I literally had to go to a post office down around the corner from my apartment in Paris and go into this wooden booth and call them, you know, collect <laughs> or send a telegram. Oh, <laughs> man. Parents, telegrams, you know. Wow. Crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. Now, how long were you in Paris? I was in Paris for a year, okay. um, had, yeah, my first job, uh, I got to go to, um, the, the Alps, the French Alps wow. and shoot Adidas. And the second trip I got was to the Maldives, which still to this day is the most amazing place I've just ever been in my life. Uh, it's, you know, it's, that was an amazing trip. Um, and then I came home, I was home for about a year and a half and I was working here, started to do commercials a little bit and I got my Screen Actors Guild card doing a little stint on a TV show. And then uh, an agent from Italy came out and I ended up going back and I ended up spending two and a half years that time. So I lived in Italy and then- um, It's amazing. Yeah, Milano and Germany, things like that. And then and then came home and it was 1984 when I came back. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I mean, when you're becoming a model, do you- is that something you have to learn? Like you have to learn how to walk. Did you do the runway thing and all yeah, that? Yeah, I did the runway and runway. I think, yeah, you have to practice a little bit and kind of um, watch the girls on the runway and see how they do it. Cause it is really kind of a particular walk that they want. They don't want you flying around and, mm -hmm. you know, waving your arms or spinning yeah, yeah. and things like that. So it's a real like uh, definite uh, kind of method they, they want. And literally when you go on the interviews for the runway shows you meet the designer themselves and then they say you know they have you walk so you walk to the end of the room and you turn around and walk back which is you know kind is that of a like funny. weird <laughs> imagine doing that for every job 
Well, <laughs> yeah, I, I get self-conscious just walking down a hallway when I know people are around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a little, I, I remember my agent saying, you're going to see Johnny Versace and you need to be very, very like this, this and that and be very, be European. Don't be American. You know, European. <laughs> and the minute I get in there, and he's like, "Hello," and I'm always like, "Hey." <laughs> you know, California, out, just like I'm very, very valley. Hey. Yeah, you know? yeah. But oh, uh, yeah. but I got I got the job. But yeah, uh, yeah. And, th and then so you came back in 1984. Yeah. And you got the Van Halen gig then. I'm assuming in 1984, right? Yes. Yeah. So, um, so what, did that happen as soon as you came back or I mean, um, was there... not as soon as I did, but pretty, pretty, you know, pretty soon after and, you know, MTV, it just really hit big. And yeah. I was, you know, like high fashion model and, you know, started to do commercials at that time too. And that was my first um, music video interview actually. And I'd gone to the casting person before, which was nice. And, you know, I, I've said that I've done a lot of music videos and, you know, some of the people that you go on the interviews to, you may, you, you like them, you've heard them, but, you know, with Van Halen, I was actually just a huge fan of theirs. So that okay. was a little like nerve wracking, you know, going in. Sure. But yeah. So she, the casting director had us do uh, an improv and they had like a classroom thing set up. Usually there's just like a little bit of props this one, it was a little, a little more so. And um, yeah, I had to pretend I was a teacher. She kind of just was like, you're a teacher in the classroom. You're giving a lesson. Go. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. Right. A lot of, a lot of direction there. So I, I, um, you know, just, I had done improv a lot in acting class. Cause I, I wanted to be an actress before modeling even, but you know, the modeling took off. So I, I went with it and I think whatever, everything happens for a reason. So um, I just, they had a ruler and I was walking back and forth and I said, okay, class, I have a math question for you. And then I just took the ruler and I went, Dave, what is 36, 24, 36 add up to? <laughs> that just came out right off the came end. Out of my right. mouth. Yeah. And even when I said it, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> but, um, and then she's like, okay, cut. Well, that's so, almost perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, um yeah interesting so I left going oh my god what did I do okay I just you know because also I know I just go on interviews whether it's for a print or a commercial or whatever and you just you do your best you can and then you leave and you go about your day and you don't like put all your hopes and dreams into each thing because that would be hugely disappointing because you might get one thing out of 10 you know um so the, you know, the guys had to look at the tapes and I'm sure there was like a million tapes to look through with sure. all the girls that I saw there. Um, so I got a call from the agency saying, okay, you, you got it. They want you for it. And I was, you know, ecstatic, but they said, you have to come in and you have to meet the band, you know, just, it's not a callback in a sense. You already got it, but they just want to, you know, meet you. And so went back to the casting place and I, I, I forget if, it was Pete Angelus that was there, but it was the casting director and somebody else. And they said, okay, the guys are back here. Come on. And of course they wanted us to show up in a bathing suit, you know, yeah. why not? <laughs> right. Just make it worse, <laughs> make it more stressful <laughs> and humiliating. So they literally opened this door into the smallest room I've ever been in. It were literally two little couches and, you know, Dave and Mike and Alec and Eddie on uh, each side of the, the couches and I just, you know, walked in and walked to the back of the little room and had to step over their feet to do it and turn around and just said hi. But of course, I shook everybody's hand, you know, right. hi, nice That's to meet you. Yeah. I don't think they ever had a woman come and shake their hand. <laughs> right, they, right. Me do it with my hand. <laughs> Did you squeeze hard? <laughs> Did you Pardon? have a firm handshake? <laughs> no, <laughs> I went like this. No, <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> I just, you know, very light. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And then I went to the back of the room and, you know, it, it, the, the rest of the guys beside Dave, they all acted a little embarrassed, like, oh, sorry, you have to be here in a bathing suit. <laughs> you know, Dave was all here. for it though, right? So they were a little like, you know, shy about it. And then Dave was all, you know, hey. Yeah. And so we just chatted a real short bit and asked a couple questions. And then I said, well, 
uh, that wasn't painful. That wasn't too painful. And Dave goes, was for us. <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that was that. And then we shot like September 6th, 7th and 8th. Okay. Um, 1984. Yeah. So a three day shoot. Broke up. <laughs> yeah, right. So it was a three day shoot, right? It was a three day shoot. And I actually, um, don't ask me why, but, uh, I just keep everything. Um, just really bad about that. But I have two of my call sheets, my original call sheets from the, from the shoot. So it has, nice. yeah. So it has like, you know, they give that to you the day before the shoot. And then when you were on the set they would give you one for the next day and it has like all every scene you're going to shoot who's got to be in makeup at what time um you know on the set and and, and all that so in the location which was john marshall you know high school um so i have two of those i'm hoping to find the third one somewhere it'd be fun what do you uh, well, you got them framed oh you here. do i was gonna say because you got a lot of stuff back there you have them yeah right i there. do um i don't know if you can see the well here's one of the call sheets okay I don't know if you can see it that's the yeah, second like, page. and then i have this one over here and then i have my pay stub um pay from stub. it <laughs> my pay stub from my agency but how, <laughs> how cool is that now that you kept all that i'm so happy i and i i really didn't remember that i did i just know my pay stubs because the we actually did the uh the van halen video through screen actors guild so they have these payment houses in chicago and in new york and things and they would you know, take the taxes out and send this check to, to the agency minus taxes. And then the agency would take their 10% and then give you this little handwritten thing with their 10% and then your total with your check. And so it's really like a handwritten little, okay. <laughs> little thing, but it says Van Halen and the total amount and all that. So I just, I framed it, you know, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, I wish we weren't allowed to take any photos on the Van Halen set, unfortunately, because I took my Polaroid camera everywhere and, you know, some modeling jobs, commercials and all the music videos. So like uh, everything, like most of the things I post are, are my own Polaroids. And I just, you know, That's um, very cool. I, yeah, I wish I would have had it for, for Van Halen, but only Niels Lowe's hour was allowed to take photos. So, mm. you know. So, yeah. so when you got to the set, I mean, are you there all day or just, um sometimes uh not all day uh i think first day shoot i was supposed to be there at three but then we shot till midnight you know or something so um yeah i just show up at different times um sometime early in the morning and you'd shoot half the day or sometimes midday and you'd shoot the rest of the day and we did just different things each day um we were uh we did the jailhouse scene so we had that set up and then they would clear that. And then we have the scene with, I'm just standing behind Dave and he's in the front. And that's when he says class dismissed. Mm -hmm. And then the, we're actually Waldo's girls. The three of us teachers are Waldo's girls in the segment where they're, we, no one's sure what happened to Waldo after graduation. So he's, he's kind of looking like a pimp. <laughs> he's yeah, got, yeah. he's got his, you know, fur coat on in front of the purple car. Um, and so then after that with Neil, we shot the three, three of us with Dave. And so, and Neil was really cool and kind enough to, I don't know if you could see those, like sign a couple of the prints. And when I, I just kind of like showed up at his studio one day, right before COVID, I, was, I caught him coming outside, putting something in the trash out there. And I was like, hey, Neil, how's it going? And um, he's like, yeah, come on in. I hadn't seen him in all decades. Oh, man. And uh, yeah, I went in and, and we, you know, talked for like an hour and then he uh pulled out the slides the original slides that he took from the whole you know video shoot and he plopped them down I said hey pick a couple out and I'll I'll print them for you so wow. he did which was really cool so he's yeah signed and printed those and very cool yeah now did you get to hang out with the Van Halen guys at all or, and talk to them well, or was it just I mean, business you know, pretty much I, yeah I mean the, the sets was pretty professional and you know it's so funny because I really expected Dave to be a little more flamboyant and funny and and everything uh but it, it was he was taking over a lot of the directing duties you know which he really wasn't supposed to I think he has a directing a direct credit on it doesn't he yeah so they had a director and I don't think their director was real happy that you know Dave was taking over so much but you know in the end look what a great video that turned out to be you know he has he's always had that vision for them. And, yeah, and I was going to say, Dave, has, has, he's had a vision. 
Whatever. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, so he was, he was great. He just wasn't, you know, he was a little more, um, you know, serious than usual, but, you know, we'd stand there before, uh, our smaller scene was getting set up and, and talk and joke around. But I, I told the story before, but, um, where he had this like mesh shirt on like this, you know, kind of like Nettie. And I was, I was joking and I'm like, Hey, do they sell men's clothes where you got that? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, oh, and he said, no, I made it myself. And I said, really? He goes, yeah, you just take a pair of fishnet stockings and then you cut the crotch out for the neck and you cut the feet off for the sleeves. And then the waistband is just your waistband. And I thought oh. that was so cool. Yeah, look at <laughs> so that. I got taught how to make a, a fishnet top from Dave. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah. But then hanging in the gel cell scene was, you know, Eddie was on the floor, had the young Van Halen behind me and the rest of the guys. And then Dave was in front of the cell. And so that, you know, hours and hours of hanging in there, hanging around in there and, and joking and you get really like punch drunk and giggly and silly. And so, yeah, we were laughing a lot and being goofy. And <laughs> how, how were the kids? How were the young Van Halens? They, you know, they were having, everybody was having a good time. It was a great set to work on and um, they were, they were having a blast, you know, so they were really sweet and, you know, having fun with the guys and, you know, I know with the one kid and he gave him a guitar, they, you know, yeah. Really Did you cool. know that Michael, the young Michael was in Christmas Story? Yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't at the time. No, I didn't realize, you know, later until yeah. later that yeah got that yeah that's too. awesome that was, i didn't know that either cool. yeah it was months ago. one of those trivia <laughs> trivia yeah. things <laughs> but um yeah um eddie was uh really funny he was on the floor so like when i had to rehearse and go back and forth he was would pretend he's gonna trip me and, and i had like four inch stilettos on and then they added like i have a lot of hair and they added all this hair to yes, my hair i remember it was like 50 was like, feet tall. It was like a lion. It was <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, that's not all my hair, but uh, yes, they ratted my hair, hair out because they wanted me to really look like a menacing detention teacher because that was my role, Wanda, teacher Wanda, the detention teacher. So um, yeah, and then uh, I had asked him, you know, later while we were not inside the jail cell, but hanging around, I said, you know, Valerie was on the set a couple times, you know, a couple of the days at least. And I asked him if I could meet her because I was kind of fangirling. You're a fan. Yeah, nothing wrong with <laughs> that. I was like, hey, can I meet? So he was like, you know, I think he got a little kick out of that. And he took me over there and, you know, just, I just said hi to her and stuff. And, and I even said like, I don't usually look like this because I was a little embarrassed of how like. <laughs> you were embarrassed? Crazy. Well, not embarrassed, but I mean, like, you know, I have a corset on, I have a whip, I have like stilettos on my hairs like this. And I'm like, hi. Uh, yeah, <laughs> she's been around TV. Sets. Yeah, she has. But I was just like, I don't usually look like this, but I just want to say hi. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. Um, so, now, after the video shoot, have you, did you ever speak to those guys again, or no? No, um, I've been in the same place with them, or whether they were eating or an event, you know, a party. But um, it was always a, a, a situation where I, I didn't, I felt it would be intrusive. You mm -hmm. know, I didn't want to. Mm -hmm. It was never yeah. like they were just standing there. I would have said, hey, hey, remember me? Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Um, but I did get a really a, a fun opportunity uh, last year. Uh, I was working at a friend's event at the LA Marathon, which um, was actually a really, really cool thing. It was just helping out with some other people. And on the last day at the marathon, it was after the, the finish line, this young kid comes, you know, uh, over the finish line and comes up and starts talking to somebody that I was working with a girl. And, um, I went over cause he had a medal on and he had, you know, he just, just finished like in maybe the first 20 people. And I thought that was really cool. So I went over and I said, Hey, is, is it okay if I take a picture with you? I think it'd just be really cool to have a picture with one of the runners. And he's, he said, sure. And so I took a picture with him and then he went back to talking to her and I said, Oh, do you have an Instagram? I'll, I'll tag you. And he said, yeah. And he says, it's Arik VH. And I typed it in and it was, I guess it's Eric. I've been saying Arik, but Arik Van Halen. And I didn't think about it, that he, that he was any relation. I just went, oh, hey, I like your last name a lot. 
And she goes, everybody oh, has that last the, name. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And she goes, oh, he's the drummer's son. And I was like, oh, oh wow. my gosh, you're Alex's son. And he said, yeah. And I said, oh, I, you know, I said, I was in, I was in jail with your dad and your uncle back in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, That's great. And I said, yeah, I was in the jail cell scene and everything. But and it, he was really sweet. But he's 100% like an athlete. You know, oh, runs yeah. marathons. Um, him and a group of people ran from LA to Vegas, I think, before that. And, oh, geez. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Mm. But, but really sweetheart. Just somebody you would expect a Van Halen to produce. A really super nice kid you know yeah yeah so that video shoot that was soon after you got back from paris now were you doing commercials during yes. this or did those come after this um i did uh what i think one of my first commercials when i came back was for kmart and it was on the olympics um I so I played during the olympics you know and yeah. uh it was for some other really cheap clothing <laughs> yeah you know i met striper at a kmart once oh did you really i did yeah <laughs> They did it in store at a Kmart. I love it. <laughs> I got a shop too. Yeah. I got to get a deal. So um, yeah, um, yeah, did a Coors beer that year and Kmart and a number of other things. And um, I did a lot of commercials actually. And then I just started getting more and more uh, video interviews. As well. <laughs> if that was a sneeze, bless no, you. No, that was a cough. <laughs> bless you anyway. Hey, thank you. But um, yeah, so... Yeah, so I uh, started going out on some other music video interviews. And, I, you know, at the time, I didn't even think about how many I had done because, you know, and go on some commercials, like a travel, go on trips to do jobs and go on a music video, do one, you know, kind of like that TV. And it really wasn't till later, um, and especially during COVID, because, you know, nobody was doing anything. Right. Uh, nobody had anything going on. I know I didn't and just sitting home doing puzzles and stuff. So I just started to post a lot more of my, you know, retro content there and, you know, my old work from, from back then. And, um, and then I just, you know, started, people are like, wow, how many did you do? And I'm like, I don't know. I haven't counted. I didn't keep track, but you know, so I was really super lucky to to be able to work with a lot of really, you know, cool artists and, and on some fun shoots for the videos. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, yeah. Roger Waters from it was his Radio Chaos album and it was a song Sunset Strip. Right. It's me with a monkey on my shoulder, walking a dog and a Great Dane was following behind us. You know, of course, mm -hmm. typical day. <laughs> <laughs> typical day. Um, and la guns i did their sex action music video which was really fun and that was actually kind of just such a classic hollywood video to do because you know they were a hollywood band and then we shot like mall and drive the walk of fame the roxy downtown up a mall and drive you know so it was just like a really really fun thing and that was those were those were a couple of all night all nighters for sure now, I, I think getting home at like four sex in the action was I think that was their first single. So they weren't yeah. really known yet, right? Yeah, they weren't. They weren't really known then. Um, I had known about them because my sister, who was a hairdresser, um, had cut um, Axel's hair. And I remember her telling me about like, oh, this band is part, you know, they were together and then they split. And that's why there were LA Guns and then it's Guns N' Roses or something. So before the shoot, I, I, I knew about them. But, you know, their music wasn't really out there yet right much, you know so yeah now did you hang out on the strip in your free time because that was um, like the heyday of the of oh the my gosh trip. i would say it's so hard to explain to people just how crazy the strip was at the time you know the music scene was huge and there you know it was m more people outside than there were even inside the clubs you know so you, you could go and see a friend's show because I, you know, I had friends and bands back then too, and you know, go see them play, and then come out and talk to people, and then go over to the rock scene, see your other friend play, and go to right. the rainbow after, you know, and and actually, you know, having my older brothers and sisters, I, you know, been to a few things where it was all age that they'd taken me to when I was really young you know any 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 time they, and luckily i was tall and i had my sister's id so i snuck in there a couple times got in there yeah <laughs> before i should have right but um, i didn't hang out there on a nightly basis you know 
you know, can't work and do that. <laughs> right. So, so uh, but yeah, saw a lot of bands play, saw a lot of, you know, a lot of my friends' bands play. And um, it was a great time. It was an amazing time for music, amazing time for shows. Um, yeah. It was, yeah. That's hard awesome. To describe. Now, were you at this time, you're being successful in your videos and modeling. Were you still trying to become an actress? Well, I had... I was still going on interviews here and there. I had, it took me a while and then I ended up getting a uh, TV agent. But actually uh, when I did come back in 85, um, I got an agent and I ended up doing Airwolf. I remember that show. And Michael Vincent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I shot that just like probably 10 days after I shot, you know, Van Halen. And we shot for a good like five days, I think. And it was at the Universal Studios. They have one of their sound stages has a half of an airplane in it so that they shoot in. Mm. And um, that they, I actually gone in to read for a different part. Um, it was like, it's supposed to be like a sexy accountant and it would be Jan Michael Vincent and I in this scene. And so I, I read for that. And the casting director goes, you know, just a minute. And then she leaves and then she comes back and she said, you know, um, you know, you did a good job reading, but we really like you, you know, your model and everything. We'd really like you to do this. And so I literally played a model with another model. Right. <laughs> um, and then we're in the airport. It was like a little bit of a, of a mini, well, like a TV movie version of the show, how they do that okay. sometimes with extended version. Yeah. And so we're, we're modeling with a designer in the airport and we have like our bathing suits on and we're flashing cameras. And then we all go into the plane and the plane ends up getting shot down. We end up under the water because that's very believable. Yes. And that's right. Kind of like with a monkey survive. on your shoulder walking down Sunset Strip with a exactly. So <laughs> another dog <laughs> following are amazing. <laughs> but um and and then you know we ended up uh you know have had a couple of lines in there and stuff like that. But it was you know an awesome shoot. And I always loved Ernest Borgnine and I was totally in love with Jan Michael Vincent since I was you know 12. Mm. So <laughs> Although, unfortunately, um, we shot at the airport and for that scene um, when we were shooting in the airport. And often I kept hearing over the loudspeaker, somebody get Jan out of the sky bar. Oh, geez. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> now, no. do you find that being a model, I, I don't know how, to, being a model first, does that affect the acting? Like people look at you as, oh, she's this model. Um, you so know, she needs to play like a model type. Does that get in the way? Probably. And being I'm 5'11", too, mm -hmm. you know, having that kind of a stature and being a model. But it's funny because when I was like 15 years old, I entered Lee Strasberg's Theater Institute where, um, you know, he'd come from New York and opened a studio here on Hollywood Boulevard. And I was dead serious on the acting thing. And my brother, Tommy and I, we lived in Northridge at the time. And I would take, we would take the bus for like two and a half hours to get to Hollywood and um, take our class. And we really, you know, we were there like four days a week doing different things. And they would have uh, people come and talk like Jack Nicholson and oh, wow. Gene Kelly came and spoke once and wow. ran into him trying to run out and go to the bathroom real quick. Uh, you know, before he came in, I'm like, I'm just going to go to the bathroom now. And then I just, flung the doors open and bashed right into him. But um, so, you know, for me, that's had what, what was what I really wanted to do. But then the modeling just, it happened and it took off more so. So I still pursued it a little bit here and there, but it just kind of went on the back burner in that sense. So, um, but, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't mad about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. So that's kind of how that went, but. Mm-hmm. So we'll ha t talk to me a little bit about the sex action video. You mentioned that, that you were in that. Um, yeah. Now, did you have to audition for that also? Or did they yes. know you from the Van Halen? Yeah, uh, Van Halen had to audition. You, it, I would say most of the time, the artists were in the room. I went on a, a Guns N' Roses interview and they were all in there. The first interview, like I just walked in and there they are. I mean, <laughs> talking what was about that part? <laughs> Pardon? What was that part for? I didn't, I didn't get that one. No, I mean, what was um, but I forget. I don't even know what song it was. Actually, they didn't tell us the song either. Um, mm -hmm. I think I, I can't even remember what song it turned out to be because I, I remember later going, "Oh, that's the one I didn't get." Yeah. Um, but, but yeah. Uh, so pretty much everybody else except for um, L.A. Guns, we 
went to a uh, casting place again. And I think the director was there. And so got that job. And then I remember when I, when I got there, somebody like, I don't know, it was like the wardrobe person or something said, got it first, you know, we saw your picture. We thought, oh, she's, you know, like a model from south of, south of the boulevard. That's like Sherman Oaks and Ceno thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're like, but then, you know, you did your, your interview or whatever, your improv and, you know, we knew you could do it. So it was myself and a girl named Roxanne and we're the two girls through the whole thing. And I had, you know, Auburn curl wavy hair at the time and she's blonde and <laughs> yeah yeah but one of my best memories from that is one of the um one of the uh places we were at I think we were at the Roxy or something we were all coming out it was it was night it was late and we were heading to downtown and Tracy's like where's your car I'll just drive with you instead of driving with the in the bus like whatever they were taking van and so I had a little older Porsche at the time um, that I brought back from Germany, <laughs> using my modeling money to get and ship over. And, um, you know, so he hopped in my car and then I had this little uh, mixtape that I had done of Alice Cooper with like Pretties for You and everything else, School's Out in 18. And I remember popping that in and then he was like, ah, I love Alice Cooper. <laughs> and I was like, me too. So yeah. we we're just like blazing Alice Cooper and, you know, driving on the 101 downtown and, you know, that that's a good memory. He's such, such a nice guy, Tracy. He's really talented, but he's just a really nice person and still is to this day, you know, just a really, really, really good guy. Yeah. He seems cool. I, I've never spoke to him personally, but you know, yeah. he seems yeah. like a good guy. Yeah. So what is more fun? Do you, do you like doing the videos or the commercials? Well, I would have to say the videos are, are uh, really fun because they're like making little mini movies and, and more yeah. so than not, they take more than one day or a half a day a commercial sometimes you could you know shoot in six hours or one day and maybe sometimes you come back a second day depending on what you were doing but um it, like especially with van halen you know i just i, I knew it was going to be a really cool video because it was van halen i'm like they always have cool videos you know and in finding out it was hot for teacher you know, I thought, wow, it's, that's, this is going to be great. But I didn't realize what a great, you know, video it was going to turn out to be. And it just has withstood the test of time. And even now I've had a couple of friends have me just do little things in their music videos, you know, just yeah. <laughs> shits and giggles kind of thing. And, you know, it's like, I talked to the, the directors and they're like, oh my God, Hop for Teacher was my whole inspiration for wanting to become a, a director in, in music videos or a director at all, you know, they just, oh, wow. so it's, yeah, it's, it was really cool to hear. I've heard that through the years, like more than, more than 10 times at least. Yeah. Do you uh, still get calls to do videos? Um, no, just like I said, I mean, I have just... a lot of musician friends and singer friends and some of them threaten me and say, I'm going to, my, my next thing, I'm going to have you in my video. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Won't hold my breath, but um, I don't know what part I would play. But uh, in my friend uh, Ryan's Pistol Beauty um, song, he had me, you know, dancing with this little smaller group of people and, you know, stuff like that. Uh -huh. <laughs> just, uh -huh. um, yeah. Just, you know, things like that. Just yeah. just for fun. And, it, and it's fun to be back on a video set. And, you know, it's always, always good people and good time. Usually. Yeah. Now, one thing I, I know about you is that you, you did a lot with helping animals, correct? Yeah. Which led you to become a vegan. Is that right? Yes. That's yeah, very so true. How did you find that love for helping animals? I mean, how, well, I mean, well, you know, we all, we all love animals <laughs> for the most, you know, most of us love our love animals, but I think, you know, I think, you know, with the, just like the cigarette companies or the meat and dairy industry or any of the industry like that, you know, there's a lot of marketing involved and we just are kind of programmed to think, you know, cow's milk's good for you. It's the best thing you can do, you know, and it's actually really not, it's really full of fat and all kinds of terrible things, hormones. And, and they don't just inject them with hormones and antibiotics. There's also in, you know, anti uh, fungals, which are not meant for human consumption at all. There's a lot of other stuff that, that goes into it. And, um, you know, we, we love our cats and our dogs and it's just doing animal rescue and like nursing something back to health that's been abused or fell off a truck or rescued from a slaughterhouse or 
you know, whatever, um, you just start to make the connection that whether it's a, a cat, a dog, a, sh a sheep, a pig, a cow, they're all sentient beings and they're all the same. And the only, the only difference is our perception of them. And, you know, we can't judge their intelligence by our inability, inability to understand them, you know, and, um, you know, no animal wants to die. They have the same basic, you know, fear and feelings and love for their, you know, when a cow gives birth, the same as a mother and being a mom myself, you know, I wouldn't want my baby ripped from me and right. given some formula while somebody else takes my milk, you know, right. <laughs> years until I fall down and then I still go to the slaughterhouse, you know? So that kind of did it. And I had a, a, um, uh, a trainer who was vegan too. And he was like, never, well, that's the animal aspect, which for me, that's the hundred percent while I'm vegan. I and that's it. why I will never eat meat or have dairy again. But the health aspects, I mean, I think in the, you know, we all know in the back of our heads, like when we're smoking cigarettes, we know it's bad. We know it can kill us, but we choose to kind of not think about it because we want to do it, you know? Mm. Um, but <laughs> finally, sometimes it'll hit you and you go, what am I doing? I'm going to kill myself if I keep smoking, you know? So the health aspects are, um, you know, there. And I, for one, went off of like three medications. I had some things that were really killing me. that felt like arthritis in my hands. It just like, I thought I was going to have to have my hands removed, but oh, you know, geez. over the course of time, <laughs> not really, I'm just being dramatic. That'd be terrible. <laughs> felt like that. I wish somebody would take my hands away. Um, you know, that, that went away because, you know, meat and dairy are very inflammatory. So and there's, you know, the only thing that has cholesterol in it is animal products. So, you know, you can go to a Mexican restaurant and get like a huge burrito with beans and rice and guacamole and pico de gallo and have a big thing of chips and salsa and not one ounce of cholesterol, you know, right. because it's all nice. But hmm. um, yeah, so the animal is what keeps me vegan. Um, it's way better for the, it's, it's just terrible on our, our, uh, um, our planet it's you know and, and I, we can feed 60 billion farm animals a year but we can't feed 7.6 billion people you know and the majority of the grain grown on earth goes to animals mm -hmm. to feed the farm animals so that we can you know and yeah. they get their protein from plants <laughs> and then we eat them for their protein and it's just this little vicious cycle of mm -hmm. it's, it's you know you don't need meat or animal products to live. So for me, I just feel like, you know, especially in working in animal rescue, um, I don't have to be a hypocrite and say, oh, I care about animal welfare and I care about animals. You know what I mean? So it yeah. helps me not to, yeah. Okay. So that's kind of what. Wait, and know. was that hard to make that switch or no? You know, I thought not having, I, I really wasn't eating very much red meat at all anyway, just, mm -hmm. and then, I never was a fish lover and shrimp for some reason, way before I went vegan, I started having kind of an aversion to it, okay. but you know, I did eat chicken, chicken sandwiches and things like that. And, um, uh, I, I, I didn't miss meat at all. I thought it was, it was going to be the hardest thing. I think the hardest thing for a lot of people are, are dairy products because they're in everything, you know, there's, there's not meat in everything. You know, you buy things in a box at, at the store and there's always milk powder or cream or milk fat. Um, but, you know, there's so many great, you know, 2023, 2022, uh, great time to be a vegan because there's every kind of plant milk, um, amazing vegan butters now that taste incredible. The cheeses have come a long way. It used to taste like rubber, <laughs> plastic, you know? Yeah. And I think, you know, for people giving up cheese is the hardest for a lot of people. But like I said, being a mom and knowing what those cows go through, you know, I am totally fine not eating it. But, you know, I you just start to find out things and get information. And of course, nobody wants to watch the slaughterhouse videos. They're horrific. You would take your kids to go pick strawberries, but you would not take your kid to a slaughterhouse. Why? You know, because yeah. it's horrific. It's yeah. horrific. But a dairy farm i don't think people realize how many thousands of, of cows there are there it's just rows and rows and rows for miles and um a dairy farm with 2500 cows puts as much much waste out as a city with 450,000 humans 
Oh, man. And that's why it's so bad for the environment as far as the methane, you know, that goes into mm-hmm. the atmosphere. And, um, yeah, you know, deforestation, they, they're cut down the forest so they can grow crops and farm the animals, and make room for that. So it's just a, a lot of aspects to it that you don't think about. I never even thought about the uh, the effect on our planet. I, I didn't know yeah, that until I, I came vegan and started mm-hmm. to, to see it. If you want, there's a, a, a video called Cowspiracy, and there's it's like the vegan three pack: Cowspiracy, Forks Over Knives, and then Dominion, which Dominion's the hard watch. You know, that's the hard part. But yeah, so it's it's really interesting to to kind of you know find that stuff out. So. And do you still are do you still work with animals? Yeah, I mean, I have four dogs. That's how mm. that happens. <laughs> 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 My son stole our cat, but that's okay. She she loves him. Um, but uh, I work with St. Martin's Animal Foundation, and um, her property was here, her rescue, but it burnt down uh, a few years back. So she moved to get more property at a better price to uh, Henderson, Nevada. But we do a lot of fundraising, um, you know, trying adoptions and uh, events and, you know, getting fosters for the animals. And, you know, we'll, we've sent people out like whole groups of people to go to like some impoverished areas where, the, you know, the dogs are starving on the street. And it's really basically a, a thing of going and getting, you know, the vets and, and getting them spayed and neutered. So you don't have the problem. They just don't have that there. You know, people are starving themselves there. And so they're not going to go and spend the money to get their animals spayed and neutered, you know? Um, so, you know, just you know, projects like that. And, and it's cows, pigs, chickens, whatever, donkeys. Yeah. <laughs> donkeys too. Monkeys. <laughs> the little donkeys are so <laughs> cute. Uh, they're adorable. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's great. That's great. Now, do you do a lot of charity work too? Because I see you post some stuff on your Instagram every now and then, like a, a, some kind of charity going on. Do you, you do a lot of stuff? Right Um, right now. Um, so a good friend of mine, Patrick Warburton, who I, you know, was putty from Seinfeld and he was in rules of engagement with David Spade and he's, um, Joe on family guy. So he he does voiceovers galore, um, for years. So, you know, I think if you saw his face, you, you know who it is, especially if you hear his voice. So I've known him since he was about 21 and we used to be at the same agency. We did some commercials together. Uh, I did his first commercial with him that he ever did. It was a really terrible, um, really crummy commercial for, for um, Mexico, <laughs> Mexico city or something for a department store. And we always say that commercial. Would be, we'd be like, well, it was just really, lo- it just was not a, a great commercial, very low tech. Um, and we always said it's total blackmail material for, you know, later in life. But um, so he got involved with St. Jude's um, a number of years ago. I think it's about his 12th year now. And so he started a celebrity golf tournament and then they have a uh, whole array. So they have a singer songwriter night, which is some um, country Western writers, music writers. They write for everybody. And it's really like a comedy show because these these people are hysterical. The way they tell their stories behind the songs that they write. Um, the most fabulous night is um, singer so- is um, the music jam night known as Rainy Palooza, and Alice Cooper always headlines. Um, we have Skunk Baxter um, this year, um, Ed Roland from Collective Soul. Uh, you know, it's just like maybe like fifteen to twenty artists come and they jam. So Alice will sing. Sometimes they'll bring a guitarist, but it, they have a house band which is six wire, and they fill, everybody fills in and just jams with each other. And it's a really fantastic night. And then yeah, the big sounds like a great time the auction. So I I am on the auction committee, so silent and live auction, and um, I hit all my friends up and everybody that'll listen and everybody that won't <laughs> to donate things. Um, so this year. Uh, Sebastian Bach is uh, signing a graphic art by a friend of mine, Rick Mapes, does really amazing art. And so he's signing that and um, he signed his autobiography for for us. And that'll go into the silent auction. And um, he did uh, art of Roger Clemens to my friend Rick. And so Roger's going to be there at the Celebrity Golf Tournament. So he'll sign it and, um, you know, just all, all different kinds of stuff, but it's, uh, last year they raised $4 million. So I wow, think we, when they started, it was like 70,000 the first time. Wow. And even during COVID when it was just online, they did, they did over a million, which is really spectacular for not having an, a live event live and in person. So, so this is uh, an event and online. It will last last a year before last because of COVID 
they had it online and they still made um, over a million. Then last year they made 4 million. So we're, we're hoping to reach that or over or something close to it. Mm -hmm. It's um, the, the golf tournament and the, all the different events that they have that, you know, yeah. brings, people, you know, brings the money in. So do you golf? No, I don't. No, <laughs> just miniature. My dad used to take me and do like with you know just half the, I don't know what you call it nine holes, eight holes, <laughs> eight holes, <laughs> eight holes, the back eight. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I kill it in miniature golf, but yeah, yeah, that's what they all say. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, so I'm looking at your background here. What do you got back there? Okay. So this is from Cream Magazine, and it was January of 1985, and it was an article on Hot for Teacher. Okay. Um, can you can you see it? Yeah, I, I think I've seen that picture. That's Dave in the white, right? Yeah, Dave and us girls. And there's that whole thing to do with, because there was three of us, Donna Rupert, Lori Butler, and myself. And there was another woman that I, the only thing I can think of is she was brought in as a body double for Lori Butler's scene where she comes in the cafeteria and she's on the desk and she rips her dress off and starts dancing. And she's got like blue bathing suit bottom and a white crop top. So she's not the first teacher with, which is uh, Donna Rupert. Um, the, the second teacher does that. And some people think it's just one teacher because they're both blonde and the scenes kind of fade into each other. Um, but I think, later on they needed some more footage to fit into the time frame of the the music and they had a woman named Lillian Mueller come in and as a body double because you don't okay. really like, at, at first I had no idea there was anybody else even in there you know watching that video forever she was um never on the set with us for the three days she's not on our call sheets so I think after they they brought her in when Lori probably wasn't available mm -hmm. okay so working, you know but anyway, I have, um, I don't know if you can see that. Mm -hmm. That's uh, with, um, um, God, Bob Seger. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to see if we're- That guy. The Bob yeah, that guy. <laughs> I did um, a little thing in American Storm with him. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh, I never forget old, what's his name here, right? Yeah. Um, and then, uh, gosh, oh, here over here is, well, then I have uh, Peter Frampton. I, I went to shoot his video. I um, spent all day and all evening with him. We shot our part and Tommy Chong was supposed to come in. He was flying in from New York or something and he missed his flight or his connector. And so my scene did not make any sense. I don't, I don't know oh, if you Tommy. remember Cheech and Chong where they had, it was called, um, it was called Dave's not here. Yeah. Where, you know, Dave's not here, yeah. man. It's yeah. Dave at the door, you know? <laughs> and so in this, in my scene, I'm supposed to um, go up to the, door i knock on it and then tommy chong's supposed to answer it and i'm supposed to say is peter there and he's supposed to say peter's not here man so my scene I, I didn't make sense to it but i got to hang out with peter for hours and hours and hours and watch him perform it was at the, i think the palace theater with the crew and um he was a hell of a nice guy too just one of the nicest people like just sat and talked yeah, to me for hours. i love to hear that yeah Good. yeah really yeah me too because <clears throat> i've worked with other people no. yeah i'm I sure <clears throat> oh excuse me i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> and then this is the um that's probably the ring oh, lights probably there but these are like a lot of these are all my polaroids that's my polaroid from the la gun shoot that's my polaroid that's my polaroid and then i took a couple little screen screen grabs like that one to put in and then mm. i did um jermaine jackson jermaine jackson i think it's love um i play a a trombone player do yeah. you know how to play the trombone you know how to play the oh absolutely are you kidding me <laughs> <laughs> don't you god of course i do that's why i was asking <laughs> um that's awesome. uh, then i have my my stoned in la guns and roses shirt from 89 framed yeah. and my cult you know, but anyway, and then I have other uh, Roger Waters stuff. And then I did work for Rick James. I did a music video for Rick James. So I have that way up there. I don't think the <laughs> yeah. it, but no, that that's great that you keep all the stuff and you, and you, you kind of document everything. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really happy. I, now I'm really happy I did. And I'm kind of going through, I've just found things through the years. I finally found my stockpile of Polaroids in a box, you know, a couple of years oh, wow. ago. And, um, 
only, I found the one call sheet a, a few years ago and then just found the other call sheet by chance in a, some other box with some weird paperwork I could have mm -hmm. easily thrown out. Yeah. So I'm hoping I, I find some other gems when I go through my garage that all the stuff in my garage used to be in my attic at my old house. So now it's, <laughs> Oh, so you still have more that you haven't gone through. I got, yeah, I got, I, I found, I found a number of cool things, but um, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Do you remember the first time you saw yourself in a commercial? Um, trying to think. Or have you ever been on a billboard? I have been on billboards in Europe and in Tokyo. Oh, that's even cooler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny. My uh, a friend of mine came back and she said, oh, I saw your billboard in, in Munich you know, whatever clothing it was. And then I was in Tokyo shooting a Japanese airline commercial, a few other people, and we were, had some time off and we were just exploring the four of us. And it came up out of the subway to see myself on a billboard, which was really nice. cool. Yes. And I don't have, I, I had my Polaroid camera with me and I didn't bring it with me just at that time. So I didn't get a chance to like take a, a picture. Oh of it. man. Yeah. But, um, well, that's uh, great. You know, yeah. Sounds but, like you've had a lot of fun. Yeah, I've had it. I, I consider myself extremely lucky, um, you know, coming from the meager means that I started with um, and, you know, being able to work on so many fun things and, and travel. And I think the traveling is a huge blessing because, you know, as a young person, not only could you not afford to go to a lot of those places, but most of the places they'd send you, you know, you wouldn't normally pick, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. going to the Maldives. I didn't know those even existed, you know, and right. then you'd be in the Black Forest and then in Sardinia and then on an island in, you know, in the British West Indies or something. Yeah. So that's, and then living right. in the other countries too, and actually living there and, and experiencing you know, the people and the culture and the language and things like that. So uh, yeah, I wish I was great. more fluent in them, but. <laughs> you mean you don't speak Japanese? Sumi <laughs> masan. I just asked for more wasabi, but um, I lived in Germany the most and I speak it the least because it's so hard. And yeah. I lived in Italy the least and I speak it the most because it's just that Latin based easier you know, sing song kind of a, um, a language, but, uh, you know, German is like, so is it hard to live in a place where you don't speak the English? Cause I always wonder that about people that come here that don't know English. I'm like, right. I can't imagine going to a country and living there and not being uh, able to speak the language. And I always absolutely empathize with people that are struggling and they're trying because that's, uh, you know, it was me, but, um, uh, yeah, it, it is, uh, you know, Germany, People will say, I'll say, excuse me, do you speak English? They'll say, oh, a little bit. And then they'll completely speak English perfectly with an, maybe even an Oxford accent <laughs> because they're in school. It was an English person that taught them how to speak English. You right. know? Italy, not so much, you know, <laughs> no. Um, in France, forget it. So yeah, um, yeah it was it was hard. Uh, luckily, I had my, you know, some friends, uh, you know, when I got there, other models and things like that. And then you just slowly learn food directions where's the bathroom <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know the necessities things. the necessities yeah so awesome yeah. all right Lori. well listen i appreciate you taking time to uh, join me this evening yeah thank you so much for having me on it was a blast yes, so nice yes. To you. all right um so people can find you online right social media yeah instagram tucker okay. underscore Lori. <laughs> yeah. very creative I was thinking about doing MT vegan, but I think it got taken. So <laughs> probably so. And, and then with your auction, is that coming up? Yes, it's coming up at the end of February on February 23rd, 24th. I think it's the 23rd through the 27th. Okay. Um, you can actually, they have amazing items that are going up for auction. So you can go online to the warburton.com on the 20th, the auction goes live. So a lot of things are bid out online right on your phone and you can keep track of it and you can just keep bidding. You don't have to, wow. you know, even go on your computer. Um, you know, even when you're there, people just bid on their phone, yeah. you go around and look at everything and then just bid on your phone. And it goes to an amazing charity and a hundred percent goes to the kids. Um, it's okay. one of the best charities out there. Uh, I'm a mother of a cancer survivor daughter that got treated out here at children's hospital, Los Angeles. So um, it's really close to my heart. And I, 
I really thank Patrick for letting me come and and help and give back because yeah. I got to bring my daughter home when a lot of parents didn't. Right. You know. right. So and and like I said, St. Jude's a great it's it's a really great charity. So, you know, you want to go and donate or bid on some cool stuff. A lot of signed guitars, a lot of really great arts, you know, art with um, music people. So, well, yeah. I'll put the link in the show notes under this. Okay. So thank you so much. Yeah, Appreciate yeah. That. All right. Well, listen, hang out for a minute. Um, but thank you very much again. Okay. Thank you.